loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Do you know this song? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Love you guys. Thank you so much again for being here today. I hope that we can learn about love together. I think about some of the things that I love. I love my church. I love my church family. I've mentioned multiple times now how much I enjoy uh, playing with our, our church band. You guys do a great job. Just appreciate you guys very, very much. I, you could say I'm biased because I play with the band, but I hope you know how blessed that we are. See you guys. Sorry. I love when I forget to tell the high school kids to get out. The high school kids, get out. It's hard for me to get used to because for years and years and years that was me, right? So it still will be sometimes. I love playing and worshiping God together, though. Uh, I, I love the look that Kara gives us. Did you notice that? Whenever she's about ready to have us hold a really long note, that little mischievous look. Did you all notice that, anybody? The band did. <laughs> but we love every second of it, for sure. But what is love? And what are we supposed to do as Christians besides love? What does it mean for us? That's what I want to look at today. Let's define love. By, by the Webster Dictionary, the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that, I believe, uh, love is uh, to care about someone deeply or affectionately. But that, I mean, there's different levels, right, than that. That's a pretty vague definition of love. Let's just be clear about that. There's a lot of different levels of love. Uh, you, you're going to love um, your, your children more than are different, I'll say, than you might love your friend or, or someone that's closer to you you might love differently or someone you're in a relationship you might love differently. But to love, that overcompassing umbrella, that's what I'm talking about t today. That kind of love is the kind of love that we need to have for each other and for God and for ourselves. And that might sound strange to have love for yourselves, but sometimes that's the hardest person to love, isn't it? I know many of you struggle with that. We, we all have at times, for sure. And it's probably one of those things that you don't even realize that you do when you're not loving yourself. But sometimes that could be the case, being too hard on yourself. So let me ask you then today to start, what are you doing to love? What are you doing to show that you deeply care about someone? What are you doing to love yourself? What are you doing to love your family? What are you doing to show your love for others? And what are you doing to love God? Because we know what God's done for us, don't we? We know how much He loves us. He loves us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you and for me. And Jesus loves me. That's one thing I know. But why do we know that? Well, number one, just like the song says, because the Bible tells us so. And if we were to look at the Bible today and we were to look at all the scriptures, all the things that God has to say about love, we, we could be here all day long. We could be here all week long. We could read every single word of this thing and it's going to lead us to one key word. God loves you. It's going to lead us to the word love. It's going to lead us to the phrase that God loves you and God loves me and God loves all that will accept his son Jesus. But I do want to look at what the Bible has to say. I want to look at a few of the scriptures that talk about love. Love scriptures. Let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Now think about that one for a second. Because when we're talking about love and what it means for us, this answers the question, I believe, of when should we love? It says, let all that you do be done in love. Well, what's all that you do? do you, here's what I did so far today. I woke up. Well, I hit my snooze and then hit my snooze again. <laughs> Maybe even a third time hit the snooze. Right? I took a shower. Drove. Drove. And it's one of those times we talk about every week, I think, sometimes. Like, we, it's hard to love sometimes when we're driving up the road. Because people, like, you all can't drive, you know? <laughs> like, it's not me. I drive great. <laughs> all right? I'm sure the guy behind me is thinking something different. But when I, drove, when I came here, when I leave here today, I'm going to go to lunch. I'm going to go eat something later. I'm going to watch TV. 
And tomorrow I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to the dentist office, and I got a meeting, and I got some other things to do, and then we got some homework to do, and everything that you do, that's all day long. So to me, this answers the question of when. Let all that you do be done in love. Is everything that you do be, are you doing it in love? Are you showing love? Are you showing that you care deeply? We should be doing it all the time. And I think that's a way to summarize this verse. Love all the time. But then who? Who, who are we going to, we know we got to love, but who are we going to love? Let's go further into the scripture. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30 through 31, Jesus answers this question. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You ever, that's a song. Y'all ever sing that one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's a good one. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So who do we need to love? We need to love God and we need to love our neighbor. The Ten Commandments are summarized with these two phrases. Love God and love your neighbor. Love each other other. Now, we all know, we know we got to love God, right? That that's, it seems easy for us. But, but Christ tells us that if we're going to love God, then we have to also love our neighbor. This one gets a little more difficult for us sometimes, doesn't it? And there's not one person here that should be able to say, I've always loved my neighbor no matter what. And if, if you think that, you're lying to yourself. And if you're lying to yourself, are you really showing yourself love? Right? You can't. You can't lie to yourself and actually love yourself. You don't lie to someone that you love. So don't lie to yourself. This is something that we all need to work on. Every single one of us. And there won't be a day in our lives where we could ever say, I don't need to work on this anymore. Maybe you're better at it than you once were. But we could always improve at loving our neighbor. Now let's talk about who that neighbor is. I'm not just talking about Dave and Norma that live next door to me over in Erlanger. They're good people. I do love them. I don't even know the other person that lives next door. I haven't, haven't met them yet. I'm not just talking about the person that lives next door or up the street or in your community or in your city or in your state or in your country. I'm talking about everybody in this world is your neighbor. Everybody. And you, like, like Jesus told us, you have to love them. I struggle with this guilty because you know what's hard for me is when someone doesn't love me and I have to love them that's difficult for me what about not just when someone doesn't love you when someone doesn't even like you what about when someone slanders you or someone hates you or someone wishes you were dead Folks, there's people in this world that wish you were dead simply because you worship Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We all did. But guess what your responsibility is nonetheless? To love them. That doesn't mean that you're going to let them like, come up and, and, and beat you up. That doesn't mean that you're going to let them do whatever they want. That's not what love means. But that means regardless of how they feel about you, you got to love them. We'll talk about what that's going to mean for us here in a minute. The scripture goes on in Luke chapter 6, 27 to tell us this. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. I don't know about you, but I'm going to shoot straight with you. And I promise I'm always going to shoot straight with you. But that, that's really hard for me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Here's what I want to do to people that hate me. Not good. My instinct is if someone doesn't love me and they want to hate me, I want to do bad to them. And maybe it is for you as well. I hope. Maybe it's just me. But we have to love them. Even our enemies. And do good to them. Wow. So how then? What does it mean to love? I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 real quick. And this one's not on the screen, so give me a second. I've got to look it up. I want to make sure I get the words just right for us today. Because this is what Paul told us it meant to love. 
Starting in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And you go down to verse 13 at that point, and it says these three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these things is love. Now, did y'all catch all those things? Love is what, this is important. Patient and kind, it's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. Now, think about the people you love in your life. Have you always been this way with them? Patient and kind. Not proud or rude. Have you always, with the people that you love, not demanded your own way? Oh, this one, here it comes. With the people you love in your life, have you ever been irritable? <laughs> right. That is kind of laughable, right? This is what Paul is telling us that love truly is. True love is. But even the people that we love, we fall short on. Some people, the couples who have been married years and years and years and years and years, have you ever seen them get irritable with each other? But you look at that couple and you know that they really love each other. They really, truly, like, that's a strong relationship right there. It's an unbreakable bond. But yet, they can get irritable with each other. I'm not going to look at you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> but that could go for anybody. And there's not one, how long y'all been married? Like 75 years? Yeah. There's not one couple that has been married one year. Or, or, or been dating for two weeks that can't tell you that they've been irritable with each other sometimes. Does that mean that they don't love each other? Absolutely not. See, the, this is a guideline for what it means for how we should love each other. And you will fall short at that. In every relationship that you have, you'll fall short at it. But what it means to love to me, that you're going to strive for that. You're going to try for that. That's what you're aiming for. That's where you're going to do your absolute best. And I think a better way to define this comes to our next verse, John 15, 12 through 13. This is my commandment, Jesus said. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Write down in your bulletin. You don't want to have to write down all that. Just put love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. In the same way I have loved you. Now guys, that's something that we have to strive for, but that is something that you'll never be able to do for me. You'll never be able to love me as much as Jesus loves me. As Jesus gave up his life, not that I could just live for another five minutes or another five years. Jesus gave up his life so that we could live with him forever. Say amen. Jesus was patient and kind. He wasn't boastful or proud. He didn't keep records of my wrongs because he forgave me. Jesus' love never fails. Think about the way Jesus loves. Jesus loves us always. Jesus loves us constantly, compassionately, caring. Jesus forgives. Every one of us now, every one of us. He just wants us to accept him. So who, who did Jesus love? Jesus loved the man who drove the nails into his hands and into his feet. Now think about this. Jesus loved that man before he picked up that hammer and drove that nail into his hand. Jesus loved him after he picked up that hammer and drove a nail through his feet. And Jesus even loved him while he drove that nail through his hands and feet. Jesus loved the man who drove the, the crown of thorns onto his head. He loved him. He was patient and kind with a love that doesn't fail. Jesus loved the man who spit in his face. Y'all, I'm going to have a hard time showing you love if you spit in my face. But I know that as a Christian, I have to strive for that, to love like Jesus. Jesus loved the man who betrayed him. 
Jesus loved Judas. But Judas isn't the only one that's betrayed Jesus, is he? Jesus also loved Peter, who betrayed Jesus by denying his name three times. Jesus also loves us when we betray him by sinning or by going off that path. And he forgives us for that. Folks, that's how we are supposed to love. When? All the time. Who? Everybody. And how? Just like Jesus. And for real, not, not just saying that we did, not just putting on a good show. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. To really love. To genuinely love. That's what we are commanded to do. Not asked. Jesus isn't like, you know, if it's okay with you, I want you to love each other. No, he commands us to love each other. And we have to do it genuine. Now listen, I'm not going to be up here judging up on people. That's just not my style. But have you ever met anybody who you don't feel is genuine? Someone who just really, really comes across. Like maybe they're saying all the right things. Maybe they're doing all the right things. But you just don't feel convinced that they're not just putting on a show. Have you ever met anybody like that? You ever bought a car? <laughs> Uh, Archie's not here, is he? Good. <laughs> I tease. I tease. I tease. But have you ever met someone that you felt that way about? You still have to love them. You still have to love them. And you can't necessarily make that judgment call if what they're doing is genuine or not. But what you can do is genuinely care. I think one of the best compliments that you can get as a Christian is when someone says to you, you're, you're genuine. I can tell you really believe what you're saying. But no one's ever going to believe what you're saying because you're saying it convincingly if you're not also acting it. In actions and in truth. We'll get to that. So then why? Why are we going to love? We know when. We know who. We know how. What about why? This is real easy. Remember the song... Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. See, if we were to read the rest of 1 Corinthians, where Paul goes on to explain love, he, he would tell us that none of, none of the things in the world are going to be good. Telling people about Christ. Prophecy, he says. Speaking in tongues, there's other languages, miraculous things. None of them are worth anything if you don't also show love. Our faith in God must be backed up with the fruit of the Spirit. The very first one, love. The one that is greatest of those is love. So Christians, I challenge you to apply these to your lives. I, I want us to go forward from here today. And I, and, I, and I want us to be showing that love to each other. And you know what? Don't be afraid to say it. Now listen, I'm not talking about like boyfriend, girlfriend. That's all on you, right? Okay? I'm talking about us as Christian brothers and sisters. Don't ever be afraid to say I love you. And, and I hope that you all listen to me when I tell you right now that I love each and every one of you. And some of you I know better than others. And some of you I want to get to know more as, as we go forward on this journey together. But the fact is, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, it's automatic. I love you. And even if you haven't accepted Jesus yet, it's our responsibility as Christians to love each other enough to share that good news and invite you to join our family. I think there's no greater example of the parables that Jesus told than one of the Good Samaritan when it comes to showing that love. Now, you can find this story in, in the book of Luke. I failed to write down the exact chapter, but you, you should be able to find it real easy. Okay. You what? Huh? Six. Six. Anyways, it's in, it's in Luke. I'm going to walk over here, Mom. You're distracting me. <laughs> This is the book of Luke. Now, the, the Good Samaritan, what a great story this is that, that Jesus tells. Let's think about this for a second. The S Samaritans were considered like the lowest of the low. 
They weren't, they weren't Jewish. They maybe their ancestors had been at one time. Right? But, but they were just considered, and the reasons why is for a Bible study lesson someday. But the reasons, they, they were just considered dirt to the Jewish people. Like, don't touch them, don't go around them. Uh, the Jewish people would, would take extreme measures to make sure they didn't go through Samaria. Uh, they would travel in a big loop to get around Samaria. It would take them extra long, just so they didn't have to go through that area. But still, Samaritans were, were around. It was inevitable. So one day, a man is walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and some robbers come along, and they beat him up real bad. And they leave him on the side of the road. And they take all his money. And they take all his clothes. And that, no, that sounds kind of weird, right? But even in our own world today, people are getting beat up and their shoes are getting stolen. Clothes were worth money. That was important stuff. So they take all this guy's clothes. He likely didn't have that little loincloth on in the picture that you see. He's over there, buck naked, and beat up. Because I want you to think about that, okay? Because that, that makes it even more uncomfortable, right? When you're, when you're walking by somebody and put yourself in the shoes of the Samaritan and these other guys that we're going to talk about. It's one thing to see somebody over there fully clothed, dressed nice, with a boo-boo on their knee and go help them. We're talking about someone who was in dire straits. Someone who was helpless, they'd been beaten so bad, and who was stark naked. Uncomfortable. Awkward, to say the least. But first man that walks by is a priest. Someone that you would expect more of, I guess. And he goes by on the other side of the road, kind of pretends not to notice. The next person that's going to come by is a Levite, or is going to be someone who works in the temple. That's their, their responsibility in life, is to, to, to work in the temple. A church worker, if you will. And he's going to kind of look at the Samaritan over there and decide to go on the other side of the road and walk away. I'm not, I'm at the man who's beaten up. Third comes the Samaritan. And the Samaritan sees the man and has mercy on him. He shows compassion on him. And he goes over and he helps him. And he puts olive oil on his wounds. And, and, and puts wine on his wounds. That's just what they did. Uh, don't do that. All right? That's what they did. And he, he puts him on his donkey. He's going to walk all the way to the end and take this guy with him. He's going to stay there with him. He's going to pay for him. And he's even going to tell the innkeeper as he leaves that day, hey, I'll stop, stop back by and check on this guy on my way back through. And if there's any more cost, I'll cover it. Which, Jesus will ask him, which man? Which one was this guy's neighbor? Which one? I think the answer to that was easy. The Samaritan. Samaritan was the one that was the neighbor. Even someone that was looked at so lowly was the guy that helped out. So what can we learn from this Samaritan? Just a few C's here today. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. The first thing the Samaritan showed was compassion. Love is compassionate. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. I praise God that he is compassionate to us. Jesus also showed this example in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they will feel faint along the way. Remember what was going on during this story? Thousands of people had followed Jesus. Thousands of people had followed to learn from the Master. From the teacher, from the Son of God. They'd gotten away because he's still going. He's, got a, he's on a journey, right? They're still following him, learning from him as they go. And they've gotten kind of far away from home. I mean, nobody got no food. No one's got anything to eat. And Jesus feels bad for them. I feel sorry for these people. See, compassion, though, it's not just feeling sorry for someone. It's more than that. Is the genuinely caring. What's Jesus going to do? Of course, he's going to feed them. He's going to take just a few fish and a few loaves, and, and he's going to have a miracle, and it's going to feed all of them. Because of his compassion, and also because the next part of, of love is charity. He's going to be charitable. Now, if you were to look in the King James Version of the Bible, you're going to find the word charity is going to be interchangeable with the, the word love. 
And that's just how they had uh, uh, translated it back in the 1600s whenever they first translated the King James Bible. And, and today's language, charity is going to be a part of love for sure. But love is bigger than just charity. But definitely being charitable is going to be part of what it means to love. Romans 12, 13 says, When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So what's that going to mean for us? Sharing. Right? Sharing. And being eager to share. It's kind of like when we come to the offering boxes, we put our money in like we've, like we've talked about before. This is something that we need to be doing joyfully. Cheerfully. It's like the scripture tells us to do. So, But we do need to share our money. We need to share our stuff. But here's something even more important that we must share. The charity that we must have in our lives is because whenever we see the lowest of the low, in our own books, the lowest of the low, we've still got to share Jesus. Or even if someone that we would consider to be the highest of the high, someone who's rich, who has all the stuff, who has all the things, you've still got to love them enough to share Jesus, to share the truth about him. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. I don't have this one on the screen either. This is a great story. Remember the story of the crippled beggar. Peter and John went to pray. They found a lame man on the way. He held out his palm and asked for an alm. And this is what Peter did say. Remember this song from when you were a kid, maybe? Silver and gold I have none, but what I do have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And what happens next? He went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God. What did Peter do? Chapter 3, verse 6, he says, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. I'll give you what I have. Folks, every single one of you has something that is worth greater than any riches of this world. Every single one of you has Jesus. Share Him. Be charitable with Him. Give Him to the world through your actions, through the truth that you live. Just like they did to this crippled beggar. But this isn't something that we can do. And it's obviously something the Samaritan showed as well, this compassion and this charity. This isn't something, though, that we can do just sometimes. Or just when people are watching. Or just on Sunday mornings. See, what did the Samaritan do? He didn't just tend to his wounds. He also put him on the donkey and took him all the way to the inn. He didn't just take care of him there. He also said, I'll be back to check on him some more. And the whole time, you better believe that that Samaritan was gone. He was thinking, I wonder how my buddy's doing. I wonder how this guy I found on the side of the road that I don't even know is doing. The love that Jesus shows us and the love that we must show each other is not only compassionate, it's not only charitable, but it should also be constant. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Folks, that definitely deserves an amen. You all still awake, right? Because I'm like, like, I'm just telling you, that verse excites me. Nothing can separate us from God's love. It is constant. Amen. And even when we look at love that is kind and, 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 and caring and not boastful and not keeping records of right and wrong, even when we do that and we think, man, I, ha I fall short sometimes, I bet that you still never stopped loving the person that you thought about when, you talk when we talked about that. Just because you were irritable, you didn't stop loving them. You just failed to show it for a brief second. See, our love as Christian brothers and sisters should be constant, just like Christ's was. And how is it revealed? No power in the sky, the verse continued. Above or in the earth below, 
Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That definitely needs an amen. Amen. Have mercy. Have mercy. And that'll be our fourth C. We are going to have compassion. We are going to be charitable. It is going to be constant. But we better recognize where love comes from. Our Savior. Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 18. Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show it with actions and in truth. We can't just say it. I said we should say it. I, I believe that. But we can't just say it. We've also got to show it. Constantly, charitably, compassionately, in a way that will not fail. Christ is love. At the end of the story about the Samaritan, Jesus, who he was telling this parable to a man who had asked the question, he said, who's your neighbor? And he said, well, the Samaritan showed that he was a neighbor in this story because he showed mercy. And here's maybe the most important thing we could hear today. Jesus said, now go and do the same. Love today, ladies and gentlemen, with actions and in truth. Would you please bow with me for a word of prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so very much and we thank you so very much for sending us your love in the form of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Master, our Friend. Lord, thank you for first loving us that we may love you as well. I ask, Lord, that you would help us today to go now, strengthened and encouraged to love one another as we would love ourselves. And to know that by loving each other, we are showing love to you. Help us to do that, not just today, Lord, but every single day of our lives. Thank you for forgiving us and showing mercy on us when we fall short. And Lord, even though, that we know, even though we know that we will fall short, we know that there's still no excuse for it. Help us to strive to love the way that you have told us to love. Which can all be summarized by saying, like your son Jesus. That's why it's in his most awesome name we now pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would y'all please stand? Sorry. Hymn of Opportunity. Is today the day that you're ready to accept the love of Jesus? We know that he loves us and we know that we should love him back. But the only way this works is if you accept his love. Don't wait another minute. Come down this aisle as we sing. <laughs>